Hi, everybody. Good morning. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late. I was in another Zoom already this morning. Oh, there's not very many people here today yet anyway. Okay, so the plan for today is that I'm going to keep talking about igneous rocks and volcanism. I want to at least mention your lab at some point before we finish because I want to uh, make sure that everyone's on the same page about what to do right now. I um, All the links and everything are in the lab seven folder, everything that you need that is. There's a set of worksheets, there's a Word doc, and there's also a PDF because um, some people are saying that the tables in the Word doc weren't displaying, they were getting all screwy if you added spaces or if you opened it in pages or Google Docs or whatever. So you can use the PDF. There's certainly really no reason you need the Word doc, except if you're gonna type in, no, that doesn't, the, the form that I have to fill in, okay, so you have a blank chart that you need to use and you're, you're going onto that um, mineral ID website, the mineral and rock ID website that I sent you to, and you're going to do virtual testing of the physical properties of the unknown minerals that I gave you. So there's like 15 that I chose. And so you'll go through each of those pages in turn, do a hardness test, do an acid test, do a, uh, you know, a streak test, all of those things, and um, try to come up with an identification for those unknowns. Now, I, I made sure to include in those unknowns um, any minerals that are in your mineral kit that you bought. So um, I would like you to figure out which of the unknowns is the same are the same as the minerals that you've got in your kit. Now you've already got those identified, right? They come it comes with a list. Believe me, if it didn't come with a list that I was I was hoping for that so that you wouldn't know what everything was and I could quiz you on them. But that's okay. We'll work with what we've got. So there are several here. Um, that are replicated virtually. When you think you've got it, I'd like you to try doing the, the physical property tests on these minerals too, so that you can see for yourself, you're getting the same answers, honestly. Um, and so that you, you know, you know what you're working with. Now I've got a couple of the one that I'm not convinced about is the hematite. I don't know what your hematite looks like, but mine is an atypical sort of hematite. It looks like it might be some other mineral just coated in hematite rather than being a big hunk of hematite. So um, I don't know, hopefully that will, um, I think you, I think you've got a hematite in your list of unknowns. <laughs> Hopefully that'll come out in your, you'll figure that out in the course of doing your lab. Everybody got there. So I went, I know that um, I went through at least one of those extra boxes that was shipped to you from our department. Um, we sent you a small box. I think it was a brown box. Maybe it was a white box that had a glass plate, a magnet, um, and a dropper bottle, a teeny dropper bottle full of hydrochloric acid. It's dilute hydrochloric acid. It's nothing you need to worry about so much. However, um, my the department technician was kind of freaking out and that's why he sent the glasses so that you couldn't get the hydrochloric acid in your eyes. <laughs> like, I don't know if you're going to like use it like a dropper. That would be dumb. Um, but that's what those are, the glasses are for. And the baking soda that came with your box is in case you were to spill all of your hydrochloric acid, you can dump the, the baking soda on it and that will neutralize it. And then you can just clean it up and throw it in the trash. Otherwise, you can take a paper towel, a napkin or something like that and just 
wipe the hydrochloric acid off or you can rinse your mineral off underwater. It's okay for it to be the hydrochloric acid to be diluted even further and to go down the drain. That's perfectly all right because it won't be as acidic once it's diluted, right? So that's what all of those are for. Does anybody have any questions about your mineral kits or about that those extra supplies that you're given? I'll just wait a second. Ah, more people have arrived. Good. Oh. Oh, I haven't, sorry, thank you for the question about um, the submission box. I haven't created the submission place for lab seven yet. Uh, are you done already? I, I, wow, that was fast. I will do that right after class to make sure that that's there. Lab seven. Any other questions about the lab or the lecture so far even, the content? Okay, um, because I went over kind of quickly, maybe I'll just show you one more time the lab seven folder. Here it is. Um, up top are like the critical things that you need. You, you need the link to that mineral ID homepage. You need um, the, the page that has the list of unknown minerals to identify. That's on this website but I wanted to give you a direct link. And then these are your worksheets, both of these. So this is the, the Word document and this is the PDF. Down here are the, this is the website that goes over the testing of the different physical property tests. He has videos where he describes doing the test. He talks about all of the different aspects of it. Um, I encourage you to watch all of those to just have an introduction to it before you actually start testing the, the, the virtual minerals. So I guess I would start on that page and watch those. Oh, I guess it's this one. This is the general page. This is the, the vi these are the videos demonstrating the physical property test. So go to this one and watch those introductory videos. Then um, this is a spreadsheet that he includes. It's all of the vert, it's all of the the unknown minerals on the website, plus some other common minerals. Um, I guess I can just show you because it's all it's right here. So he he lists this, there are a bunch of different tabs down here. This, these are all the minerals. He's got the metallic ones, the non-metallic ones. So one of the first things that you should do when you pick, when you choose a mineral is decide, does it look metallic? Does it have a metallic luster or does it have a non-metallic luster? Something more earthy or dull um, and start there because there's, there are a lot fewer metallic minerals or with the metallic luster, that would narrow your choices down quickly. Um, the non-metallic minerals, there are many more of those. So uh, he also has those broken down. I'm just gonna open this window a little bit more. Those broken down by hardness and streak. So um, then one of the next tests you could do is the hard, a hardness test to see how hard is this mineral and then a streak test to see what the streak looks like. And that will send you to these tables, like whether it's soft, it's not as hard, it's less, it's not quite, or sorry, it's less than a 5.5 on the hardness scale, or it's greater than 5.5. Same with the streak. Um, this is a streak that is white, that is with minerals that are softer than 5.5, white streak and harder than 5.5 and non-white streak. And I, that's, those are all of the tabs. This will narrow down your choices. Um, and then you can use the other properties. So it's got, um, whether it's magnetic, whether a mineral reacts with hydrochloric acid, um, 
he demonstrates the electrical conductivity test using a flashlight and um, which is pretty cool. So check that out. Those, well, I mean, those are all, those are there already. I think those are near the bottom of each of those testing pages. Um, but this is how you're gonna get closer and narrow down even further to actually name the mineral. Um, and then he also has a visual bank. I'm trying to get back there a visual bank of minerals. So you can just do a visual comparison. Here we go, the visual bank. So here it's literally, there are the metallic minerals up top and some non-metallic minerals. So these are gonna look different than the unknowns look, but each of these has many of the same properties, physical properties that you would need to identify it, just visible in the, the photos themselves. So you can also do a, a, a like a visual match. Um, but remember, I've said a few times, be careful about color, not the color of the streak, but the color of the mineral itself, because that can be really deceptive. And for instance, you've got six different sort of white, white or colorless minerals, all those that um, you, there's no color to rely on. So you need to um, use all of the other properties. And there are some in here that I, I, on the website actually do have colors. So it's gonna, it'll be a challenge um, to match them to your kits too. I don't have a place for you to record that, but it would be very easy for you to, um, to simply add it to the, this is your lab, the lab worksheets. I give you, well, here, where I was gonna go is this. So th that's the list of unknowns. And then this chart includes some that are not on this list. So you don't need to do all of them that are in the chart, right? Just, just the ones that I've said so. So you could um, mark the number corresponding to your, your mineral kit sample on this lab also. Uh, and again, I think maybe the easiest thing to do is to print out these chart pages, at least the ones that you need, and to work by hand on that. Um, I gave you a visual Mohs hardness scale. So an example of, and I, I tried to choose images that were pretty typical of these minerals. Some images of the different minerals, the, their hardness on this scale, and then some of the, the hardnesses of the, the testing materials that you'll use, like a glass plate or the streak plate. Those have fairly consistent hardnesses, there's some variability, right? In the mineral and in your materials that you're gonna use. Like the streak plate's not exactly six and a half, it's somewhere between six and a half and seven. The glass plate is close to a five and a half. Your mineral might be close to a four. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly a four. Like for instance, if you have fluorite in your kit or in the online visual, in the online unknowns, it won't necessarily be perfectly four, but as long as it's close, you know, plus or minus one, I would say is the tolerance you should give it. Um, hopefully you all have a penny some, sitting somewhere around, you can use your fingernails, um, an iron, like any kind of nail, like an iron nail that you might hammer into a board, you can use that. Um, the glass you have, you don't have to worry about a steel knife um, or a steel file. This is a steel nail versus an iron nail, I guess is the difference. So that's, and, and because if you pick up a nail, you don't necessarily what it's comprised, what it's composed of, it could be anywhere in between four and a half and six and a half, honestly. So maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's better not even not to use the nail but you've got the glass plate and you've got a street plate to use. So that's great. 
Um, remember too that I said you can clean your streak plate up uh, by just washing it. I know that you know in class I put I actually use the hydrochloric acid in a paper towel just to clean them off, but I don't think you actually need the hydrochloric acid. You can just like wash them with soap and water. You need to dry it though before you can use it, and because it's porous, you should just like let it dry for a while, like maybe an hour. Um, also, when he shows you in the demonstration of hardness when he's got a glass plate, he's, he scratches the mineral across the glass plate and then he uses his nail to kind of test the scratch. That's important because you don't know if you've simply powdered the mineral by, by crushing it or whether you've actually scratched the glass. So that's what he's doing is testing to see whether he can feel the scratch or not. Because if you can't feel the scratch, then it hasn't scratched the glass plate. Okay, so I guess, um, okay, this is the last thing I'll say. This is a, a, a kind of a summary of the, the properties that are, that you're able to test using this these virtual minerals and the virtual tests. So for example, he's got, you can distinguish between metallic and non-metallic luster. You can distinguish hardness. You can use the street color. And then there are some other properties you can use, magnetism, the acid test, looking at the fracture or cleavage. So fracture is just where it breaks naturally. And then cleavage would be a flat plane. So the first thing you would wanna do is pick up your mineral and he does this, he shows you kind of a glint. I've got a, oh, good. Okay, I'm gonna try to show you this. I'm gonna try to flash this at you. Can you see that flat surface? Do you see it? Anyone, anyone, do you see that? Is it flashing at you, shiny? You see where it catches the light right there? So um, it's got kind of a, it's almost a glassy surface on that cleavage plane. Um, if you get a nice flat surface like that, it is a cleavage plane. You don't have to break your minerals. Here's the biotite again, there's the cleavage plane. It's It flashes at you too. So, um, if you're not sure if you're looking at cleavage, I would try seeing if it reflects light back at you in a bright way. Um, that's not necessarily gonna work all the time. Like for example, with your pyrite, the fool's gold, they're tiny little crystals. So each, and they're cubic, you can see the little cubes if they don't have striations, if they're nice flat cubes, um, those should also reflect the light in a shiny, well, in this case, a metallic sort of way. But you've gotta be looking at it with your, with your hand lens. Now you've got the, the, the plastic hand lenses, which are pretty good actually. And what you wanna do, and students make this, Students usually try to do this. They try to like hold the hold the magnifier away from your face and look like that. That's not the way to do it. The better way is to to get in close, bring the magnifier to your eye, and then bring the the minerals to your eye. Sunlight is the best. If you can get out in the sunshine, that's the best way to evaluate the the luster, the cleavage, the fracture the color, all of those things. Um, so I would look closely at that like that because you're not gonna see anything when it's this far away from your head. Okay, any questions about how that works? Okay, good. Is there another question I'm just saying? Okay. Okay, um, that is it for this one. If there are no other questions, then I will just leave it at that. So
so just remember, please do add to this lab. It's not an instruction in your lab yet. I'm going to modify them, but you will have already started. Don't wait until next week to start this, please, because I'm going to add a, a second part to this lab. I'll see if it's a second part or if it's just the igneous rocks. I'm going to add something next week. So definitely start on this one. Um, don't forget to make the comparisons to your lab, to your mineral kits. Okay, cool. I hope that goes well. Let me stop sharing here. Okay. If there are no more questions, then I will get back to the slides. We started talking, or wait, let me find my, it's already open. We started talking about, let me share these before I start talking about this. Okay. All right. Here we are. This is not in the right place. Um, do I want to keep this? Yeah, I'll leave that there. Okay. So we started, sorry, just thinking. Um, I took out all the the outline sort of slides um, to try to speed up this lecture. Remember, I remember I ended up with like somewhere over a hundred slides. It was ridiculous. I'm down to something like 80, <laughs> which feels pretty good. But I feel like this 80 um, is like the critical 80 that you need to know. We started off talking about textures. So phaneritic, aphanitic, porphyritic textures. We started talking and, and then continued talking about, here, I'll just show you this one again. We were looking at the textures. So plutonic that are coarse grained rocks versus volcanic, which are the fine grained rocks, right? Or glassy, which is not fine grained or coarse grained, it's glass. There are no crystals in there. It's quenched so quickly that it it doesn't. There's no time for those crystals to grow at all. Um, what else? I also talked about the chemi the chemistry being the same across all of these. So obsidian, rhyolite, granite. If they're from the same magma, then they all have the same chemistry, identical, and the texture is simply will differ based on where the rock is erupted or not erupted, crystallized under the surface of the earth. So all these plutonic rocks are growing or cooling, cooling slowly. And so the crystals are growing large. The volcanics are cooling quickly and so small crystals. We looked at the range from felsic to mafic uh, compositions. And I told you that we weren't, I wasn't going to bother with ultramafic rocks in your labs at all. But we will look at some, um, I will add ultramafic as far as like looking at the chemistry over all of these things. What else? I'm just going to summarize quickly in case someone wasn't here on Tuesday. I only just got the link up to the slides. Um, it, it, there was a problem with the processing on YouTube, and so it took me longer than usual to get the slides up. And then we left off, we, we looked at um, color index and estimating the percentage of dark minerals. And we left off somewhere here, looking at the light colored, fel light -colored minerals that, that make up the felsic rocks and some intermediate rocks, and then the dark minerals that make up the mafic and ultramafic rocks with intermediate rocks just having the composition and a, a composition somewhere in between. There's this, this plot. Okay, I think this is maybe where we, did we end here or with Bowen's reaction series? I think we ended with this one. We so haven't I, I, Bowen's yet. We didn't get to Bowen's, thank you. Okay, so some important things that I just wanna highlight here. The composition, the silica content and the gas, the volatile content, the gas content 
Um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna mix, switch between saying gas and volatiles. So I hope that that is making sense to you now. The volatiles just, if these are all the bubbles or all the gases that are released into the air during a volcanic eruption, but underground, these gases are dissolved into the magma itself. They don't come out until the pressure is released off of the magma and then bubbles start to form. With a little bit of pressure re you know, reduction, you get tiny bubbles forming and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I, I showed you how they, they rapidly increase, like exponentially increase in volume uh, the closer these magmas get to the surface. And so if you were to, to take the the burden off of the top of volcano with a landslide, like in the case of the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. And before that eruption, landslides weren't really recognized as a mechanism to induce eruptions, like to, to trigger an eruption, um, but they have been since then. Um, there are a couple of factors that come into play there. Not only, so those were rhyolitic compositions, the, the magmas that were, the, the magmas that are in the stratovolcanoes are going to be somewhere between an andesitic and a rhyolitic composition. The more rhyolitic, the more silica and the more gas that those magmas have, the more explosive it's going to be. And these two interact in a way to make it more explosive too, because the silica, the those silica tetrahedra that I showed you, they increase the viscosity of the magmas so that they don't flow very far. Remember, I, I started to mention steep sided lava domes. I'm going to show you those pictures today versus like a not very viscous basalt lava that spreads out easily. You form these rivers of lava uh, easily. It, it, it runs like a liquid. It's a thick liquid, but it's it looks like a liquid when it's still hot. Um, that silica that causes that viscosity increase also kind of traps the gases in the magma. It makes it harder for those gases to escape the magma. So even though basalts might have like, let's say a percent or two of dissolved gases, it's less, it doesn't have as much silica. And so those bubbles can escape. They can, they start to form. And while they're small, they can still like migrate their way out of the magma because gas is even more buoyant than a liquid. So gas rises out of the liquid and they can just escape. You've seen pictures of volcanoes with steam coming off and those are volcanic gases. And, and that's that, that gas escaping. But in the rhyolitic magmas, there's less of that. It doesn't escape. And so it's trapped. And that means you get that exponential increase in the volume of the original amount of gas, essentially. And so there's more gas still in the magma by the time it erupts. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, and that so that makes it more explosive. So these, these all these all work together. The temperature too works together because the lower, the cooler the magma, even though this is not cold, the cooler the magma, the more viscous it's gonna be too. And the more viscous, the more difficult the gases will have, the more, the harder the, the harder the time the gases will have to escape. Okay. So if you wanted to just don't worry about like the value of the viscosity and poises, just, just say high viscosity for rhyolitic, low viscosity for basalts. That's what I'm talking about. That, that's what I want you to know. Okay. Um, we're going to look at these kinds of volcanoes that are formed uh, as a result of different kinds of magmas from shield volcanoes and the cinder cones that we see in Hawaii to, um, to the strato volcanoes and the domes, the lava domes that form uh, from the rhyolitic, from, those, from Mount Fuji, from Mount St. Helens, from any pointy peaked volcano you've ever seen.
All right. Bowen's reaction series. I don't I don't want to dwell on this too long because um, it's complicated. I just want you to understand some of the fundamentals. Bowen came up with this sequence of mineral crystallization from magmas. So start up at the top of this plot um, at the highest temperatures, let's say 1400 degrees. Um, and it doesn't, you know, this might be down in the mantle. So we might start with an ultramafic composition, um, but you don't always start with an ultramafic rock. That's one way in which this becomes is a little complicated, but just to keep it simple, at high temperatures, the first minerals to crystallize are olivine, that green mineral, um, which is also considered one of the mafic minerals. I told you to count the, the green olivines and with the black pyroxenes and amphiboles. Um, maybe a tiny bit of calcium rich plagioclase. You certainly start to get a lot of calcium rich plagioclase when you get into the basalts, when you start to get down into more mafic compositions. In a mafic rock, so like a basalt or the intrusive equivalent is a gabbro, you're getting mostly maybe a little bit of pyrex, sorry, a little bit of olivine, a lot of pyroxene, maybe a little bit of amphibole, and calcium rich plagioclase. When you get closer to andesite, you're getting cooler too. These magmas are cooler. You tend to have more amphibole, less pyroxene, more biotite. And instead of a calcium rich plagioclase, you have a sodium rich plagioclase. And what this means, the continuous series, it means it's referring to the solid solution between calcium and sodium in the plagioclases. So those, those two elements just swap out for one another. They're the same charge, they're the same size, they have a similar kind of bonding character. So they swap out in the crystal lattice easily. Um, so, um, and then at the very low end, ah, at the low end temperatures, let's say 800 to 650 degrees, something like that. And these are all rough because you could have a thousand degree granite, sure. Um, this is when you start to see it's a little bit of amphibole, some biotite, and then more potassium feldspar. I've been using, you've seen a couple, maybe two or three different ways to describe these, this mineral. Potassium feldspar, K feldspar, K is the abbreviation for potassium, or just K spar. So I might say any of those three, I'm sorry, but hopefully that makes sense to you that the K means potassium. So potassium feldspar, those pink feldspars, not always pink, but um, you do have a, a pink potassium feldspar in your kit. Um, this is an orthoclase that I was showing you for that. It's, you know, it's pink-ish. It's not like pink, pink, but pink compared to a white mineral, like pink compared to that, yeah. Okay. Um, and quartz are down here at the low end. And that's what you would get in a granite or a rhyolite. This, okay, so the chemistry overall I've summarized here. So up at the top, like in the mafic, ultramafic, that's where the chemistry is rich in its iron, iron, magnesium, calcium, and less, it's low in silica, lower maybe 45 to 50-55% silica. Down here, it's rich in sodium, potassium, and rich, more rich in silica. So uh, it's more like 70-75% at the highest. This plot, this Bones reaction series works in the other direction too. So instead of thinking about this as crystallizing a magma, this can also be melting a rock if you go in the other direction. So you start down at the bottom of the plot. You start off with a rock that's at say 200 degrees. It's hot, but it's still completely solid because all the minerals have crystallized. So you've got a hot rock somewhere down in the crust. Well, if you were to bury that, let's say there was a thrust fault that pushed a chunk of crust over another chunk of crust. So it buried it. 
And over time, that's going to heat up. And maybe it heats up to 600, 700 degrees Celsius. When it does, it's going to start melting these minerals in the same order. I'm sorry, in the opposite order, but in the, you know, in the same sequence. But you're going to go, you're going to melt the quartz first and the muscovite and the case bar first, then the biotite amphibole and sodic plagioclase and on. So it works the same. These are crystallization or melting temperatures. It depends on what you're talking about. Are you, I mean, mostly people use the Bowen's reaction series to talk about crystallization of a magma. So this is temperature of crystallization, but just keep in mind that I might ask you about partially melting a rock. If I were to heat something up, you know, if, if I were, you know, one of the questions might be, and I, I, you know, for, for your sake, I'm always thinking about like what a potential quiz question might be. It could be, all right, you've got an andesite sitting somewhere in the middle crust that um, comes up against another, let's say another intrusion heats the andesite up and it starts to melt. Which minerals are gonna melt first? What would you say? You can type it in the chat. I'm looking at the chat or you can say it. Sorry, could you repeat that please? So if you were to start with a solid andesite, so somewhere in here, which minerals would melt first? Um, the biotite micas. And what else? Plagioclase and amphibole. Well, yeah, I was trying to hint at the sodium rich plagioclase. Yes, the amphibole would follow shortly after the biotite, yeah. But the very first minerals would be the biotite and a sodium rich plagioclase. Um, yeah, I, think I have I'm a question. Ask. Yeah. So um, as the melt cools and the minerals crystallize, the plagioclase, um, so as it cools, the um, sodium is more likely to be present than calcium as it cools? N Wait. Because so we're the starting with the magma now we're talking about. Is that yeah. right? So the calcium, um, as the minerals crystallize, the feldspar at the um, higher temperatures, it goes from being more calcium rich and gradually becomes more sodium rich as it cools? Yes. OK. That's exactly right. In fact, um, sometimes you can even see, or I'm trying to get this nice, um, you can even see zoning, like you'll see a crystal that you can see lines like as it grew because minerals start crystallizing at a point and then they start growing bigger and bigger around that point. And so in the end, you might have a, a plagioclase that's more sodium rich on its rim and more calcium rich on the in the center for this very reason. I can't seem to get this one lined up. Okay, I'm gonna leave it like that. Okay, I put the abbreviations there, sodium and calcium, if it's helpful for you to remember that, um, because I also include sodium down here, right? And then calcium up here, if that's helpful. Okay, so yeah, if you're talking about um, random magma and yes, overall, you're going to start off with a calcium rich plagioclase. Unless it's a, an ultramafic rock and you don't have any plagioclase, yes, that's what's going to happen. Okay, but let's say you've got a granite. Start off with a granite. What's the, what minerals are, give me the five minerals that are most likely to be in a granite. You can use this diagram, it, it tells you. So if you're if you don't know how to answer this question, you should be asking me questions right now because some a question like this is bound to show up at some point. So tell me like what five minerals are or six? Okay, give me six. Six minerals that are likely to be in a granite. Would it be the bottom section, the quartz, muscovite, mica, the potassium feldspar? Yes. What else? Uh, 
I don't think you said six. The K felt. You said the K felt spar. I heard quartz. I heard biotite. Uh, no, I said the muscovite, Mika. Muscovite. Okay, quartz, muscovite, K felt spar. Three more. Um, it's these three that I'm after. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Even though there's a, a line there separating granites from andesites, it's it's a fuzzy line. It's not a hard and fast boundary. So, I mean, you've seen some black minerals and granites already. I've pointed to them in examples. And those are often the biotite and the amphibole. But there's also some plagioclase in there, but it's a sodic plagioclase. So in the granite, you're likely to have this, this should probably be a note in your notes right now. A granite is most likely to have quartz, muscovite mica, case bar, biotite mica, an amphibole, and a sodium rich plagioclase. If we're talking about a basalt, you want to try that one, somebody? Um, if I could try the amphibole. Yeah, give it a shot. The, the pyroxene and the yes. olivine and oh, the yeah. plagioclase feldspar. Tell me about the plagioclase feldspar. Um, would it be the calcium rich? Oh, no, the continue. Oh, yeah, the calcium rich? It's both. It's both. It's because oh, it's okay. kind of like in the middle, unless you're up at the very top or down at the very bottom, I would just say it's both. And in that case, okay. you can just say it's plagioclase because it's calcium and sodium in there. And there's one more mm -hmm. mineral you haven't mentioned yet. You um, said olivine, pyroxene, plagioclase. And the amphibole. And a little bit of amphibole. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So these are your mafic minerals on this side. This whole discontinuous side, these are your mafic minerals. These are all considered the dark minerals, the black or the green minerals. These are all, ah, I'm sorry. These three are black. This one is green. These are generally white. <clears throat> Case bar can be pink or white. And then muscovite is silvery quartzes usually colorless in a rock. We don't usually say like, yeah, we don't usually call quartz white. Although if it was cloudy, yeah, I suppose it might be actually white, but if you can, if it's transparent, it's colorless, most likely. Okay, so do you get that, the idea of this then? So you, I hope that you'll be able to tell me which elements are more abundant in a granite versus a basalt? And which minerals are more likely to, to show up in a basalt versus a granite? Okay, and if you can do that, then you can also tell me about andesites because you can just give me a mixture of those two. If it was an andesite, you're not gonna include the olivine. You're not gonna include muscovite and quartz or case bar. Okay, so don't don't include the, yeah, yeah, chemistry the same. So um, questions and about I have this? a question. Yeah. yeah, I know it's not listed on here, but can't you find hornblende in granite too? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the arrow the arrow should have gone just to the tip there. It doesn't. Maybe I should add a little arrow, actually. Let me try to add a little arrow. <laughs> oh, it's too long. I'll extend that guy down there. Come on, it doesn't want, oh, I see what's happening. Can't quite reach it. There we go. So I've officially extended the arrow for you. <laughs> Think of the amphibole like the biotite. It's gonna, even though it has slightly higher melting temperatures and higher crystallization temperatures, um, they are found in granites. 
So Wait. Hornblen falls into the Ampleboles? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Okay. I say Hornblen and it, yeah, it's an Ampleble. Thanks for kept calling me on that one. Okay, any other questions? I have one actually. Okay. Um, it's just uh, the uh, plagio, how do you pronounce that? The plagio class? Plagio class you could just say plagio. plagio, then be done with it. <laughs> sorry. Um, um, that, um, the fells, that, the, sorry, that one. The plagio. Um, is, mm -hmm. is it that one part of the ultra matic? Um, ultra, it, oh no, it says matic. Oh no, it's supposed to be mafic, ultra mafic. <laughs> I didn't notice that until you just said that. Oh dear. Okay, I'm gonna get an F going on in there. Yeah, tell me. Ask the question. So is that supposed? Is that also a part of the uh, ultra mafic yes. um, rock as well? It can. There can be five percent or less plagioclase in an ultra mafic rock, but it it's usually like none. But it it might be here or it might be a tiny bit just think of it as being a tiny tiny bit kind of like well you know you see how these stretch into the next field like a little bit of amphibole and a basalt but mostly pyroxene yeah think of that that way it's a little bit of plagioclase maybe but mostly pyroxene or olivine okay thank you you're welcome any others okay good because enough diagrams, let's look at some pictures. Um, okay, so a few things I want to say. We've been ta I've been talking about the Sierra Nevada. I've been talking about Yosemite granites. This is a famous picture. Ansel Adams was a, a famous photographer, especially for taking pictures of Yosemite and other national parks. This is one of his with Yosemite Falls, and this is El Capitan. There's Half Dome there. So the reason that El Capitan has its sharp-sided the steep sided uh, mountain there and half dome is just half a dome and all of this is steep sided is because oh that's not half dome half dome's back there sorry that's half dome back there that's something else that fooled me um and that's not yosemite that's bridalville falls sorry yosemite falls is on the other side of the valley dope okay yeah now i'm remembering anyway what happened was that's called this valley, Yosemite Valley is typical of a what's called a U-shaped valley. We're going to talk about these when we get into glaciers, but glaciers came through here in the Pleistocene and Pliocene. So that's a maybe there was a big glaciation around 120,000 years ago. And that continued with different glaciations, like glaciers would would grow and then retreat, grow and retreat. And um, that continued through like 12,000 years ago, maybe 10,000 years ago, but that's what carved this valley. And that was part of the reason that we can see so much of the Sierra Nevada batholith. And the reason I gave you this slide is to describe the word batholith and plutons, because we've been using those, I've been using those terms, but we haven't defined it yet. This is the, the Sierra Nevada batholith down here. Here's the Coast Range Batholith, an Idaho Batholith. These are large bodies, so over a hundred square kilometers. Is it square kilometers? Cubic kilometers, I think. I think I messed that one up. Cubic kilometers. Now I have to check. It's a lot of granite. <laughs> and a batholith is what is made up of many small plutons. A pluton is basically what you call a small body of magma. So you have a little pluton, a little body of magma, and many, many hundreds of those are growing and coming up from that subducting slab. This is before the San Andreas, right? This is like 65, 100 million years ago to 65 million years ago, we're talking. This is when the Farallon plate was still subducting beneath North America, and there were volcanoes erupting. But beneath those volcanoes were these magmas uh, that were feeding the volcanoes. But over time, especially after the subduction stopped, so after 30 million years when the transform boundary came in, there were no more melts being generated at all. 
from the subducting plate. So everything cooled down and we're left with a bunch of granites in the crust. The reason we can see it now is because it was uplifted over time, probably from during the collision, it was uplifted somewhat in the mountains. And then you've got normal erosion from wind, from water, rain, rivers, waterfalls. And then we had glaciers come through. So the glaciers scrape the top of the, the granites clean, clean off basically, most of them, especially down the valleys. Um, and it, it exposed a lot of the, the body of the batholiths because we see in these U-shaped valleys, we can see all the granite now. But these are large, big bodies of melt that all came from that subducting slab. Not melting of the subducting slab, the water being driven off the subducting slab that lowered the melting temperature of the mantle. Okay, so don't forget that every batholith used had volcanoes associated with it. That those were just above in the in the crust. So batholith down here, above the batholith, those ma those magmas when they were still molten were feeding volcanoes. Okay, so here's a diagram to explain that. So down below the volcano, there's the volcano up top. Here's a magma body or a pluton, also plutonic, pluton, those words are related. So the pluton, that body of magma is feeding the volcano along just some pipe, some conduit that, that maybe it's a fracture, maybe it, it could be the magma forced its way, it opened a, a fracture to become a wide conduit. Um, and eruptions created the volcano, like sequential eruptions. This is this, the lines here are indicating multiple eruptions, one after another, after another, after another, and then depositing that material on the side. And the volcano's shape, the, the stratovolcano shape that would be formed in this situation comes from the fact that most of the time, you know, any lava flows are building up the sides of the volcanoes. Um, but the vast majority of the ash and the cinders and the, the small pebble-sized lapilli blocks and bombs, they're falling close to the volcano. So that builds up the sides of the volcano more over time, even if the ash gets blown farther away. Um, most of that material falls near the volcano. And once that melt is no longer rising, once it stopped being fed from below, then um, it's gonna cool and crystallize down here. And if it does, first of all, the volcano is gonna die. It will become dormant and then extinct after a while. And then whatever remaining magma was down in the crust is gonna cool and, and crystallize. Okay, stop me if you've got questions. So here's a visual representation of what like Yosemite would, would have been like. Here's a cross section and the, this is like over time. So while the volcanoes are active, you've got magma down here below feeding these pipes, it might be sills and dikes um, feeding the volcanoes and you've got eruptions taking place up here on the surface. Um, and that's what you're seeing here in cross section. Um, the dikes are the ones that cross cut these layers and the sills are these ones that are parallel to the layers of the rock. I'm sure you've read that in your textbook by now. The, the, con the collision, the ocean continent collision that takes place to, to create the volcanoes in the first place to generate those melts um, is going to also thicken the crust because we're we're buckling and folding we're fo thrust faults are developing and we're building up the thickness of the mountain belt at the same time uh, and so that's lifting these rocks up higher relative to where they were relative to sea level so over time it might look like this with a, an extinct volcano maybe some of those rocks still exposed on the surface and then erosion over time is gonna to lead to exposure of those, of the batholith, of those plutons that were down there. 
And we know that they're made of plutons that are all di slightly different because you can go and you, if you go to Yosemite, I mean, have people been to Yosemite? I think probably several of you probably have. Yeah, you give me a hands up on the participants if you've been to Yosemite. It's not far away. So if you haven't been, I really recommend you make a trip. It's a road trip sort of thing, like maybe after the pandemic, right? Um, awesome, some of you have, good. Uh, now I forgot what I was gonna say about that. Oh yeah, you've seen different looking granites there. You maybe didn't notice when you were there because you hadn't taken a geology class, but if you were to go now, you'd probably see that some have these big honking pink case bars in them. Others have big white feldspars. I don't know if they're case bars or plagioclases. Others like dikes with big micas or biotites and quartz crystals. And it's really variable everywhere you go because each individual pluton is contributing to this batholith. And each pluton is slightly different chemically. They might all be granitic or they might be granodiorites. I've mentioned it's a little more plagioclase and case bar and a granodiorite, but um, that's how it works. So over time you get this as a winter time. There's half dome back there. So this is almost the same picture as that Ansel Adams. That's Bridalville Falls there. So after about um, 65 million years, this, this is the situation. We had these, this batholith had been formed and then it was erosion for after that. Okay, I, I showed you a diagram that used quartz, case bar and plagioclase to name the plutonic rocks. This is the same diagram, but for volcanic rocks. And we don't use this diagram for volcanic rocks because they're too fine grained to see the case bar, the plage and the quartz most of the time. So it's not really like this even includes um, andesite and basalt down here in this plagioclase corner. So we don't use this. It's not really helpful because we can't count. We can't estimate the percentage of those different minerals. So um, we don't use it. This is the IUGS, that, that group. Um, that establishes the naming conventions. Um, the minerals are too small. So um, you have to analyze the chemistry of the volcanic rocks really to know what's in the rock. And that's usually done by X-ray fluorescence or you can abbreviate that XRF. You don't necessarily have to remember that, I'm just telling you. Um, what you do is you take the rock and you crush it up. You create a powder essentially of the rock, a very fine powder that you mix very well. And then you can analyze it in an XRF. You put it in um, into essentially an oven that you heat up. Uh, it's like a furnace. You he heat it up and you start to burn off all of the elements essentially. And then you can measure them once they're in a gas form. And then we use, once we have that analysis, then we can use what's called the total alkali versus silica diagram. I'm going to show you in the, the next slide. So that's the diagram we use to actually name the volcanic rocks. If you don't have that chemical analysis and you're not going to in a lab or if you go into the field um, or if you just take a trip to Yosemite, you're not going to know, you can make educated guesses. Um, based on the color index and based on what the phenocrysts look like. So I'm gonna give you some handy dandy guidelines in a second. I created a figure to, to help you use, make those educated guesses. This is the total alkali versus silica diagram. Um, this is the, these are the total alkalis. That means the sodium and the potassium and on one axis versus the silica on the other axis. So just notice where rhyolites are. So a rhyolitic uh, chemistry would be up here, like 70% silica and higher. A basalt is down here officially between 45 and 51% or two, maybe 52%. No, that's, if that's 50, that's four, that's 51, that's 52. 
So 45 to 52%. This is the official way that we name those rocks. So until then, you're just making an educated guess. Scientists included. We don't know either. If you've got a microscope, you get one extra bit of information. Like you can see the, the composition of some of the tiny crystals. Like here's an andesite with an affinitic matrix or ground mass. Um, so the, most of the rock is just this uniform gray color, but it's got these phenocris. That's this, this word here, phenocris. The phenocris um, of hornblende, this is an amphibole. Okay, so that's, it's a dark mineral. It should be considered a mafic mineral. Um, but, but like, it's, this is a hard one to pick. Like I'm telling you it's an andesite, but it's pretty light colored. So if you were gonna use the color index, it might lead you in the wrong direction. You might say, oh, it's a rhyolite because it's light colored. Um, you would be, you'd be mistaken in this case. So I'm gonna, the next slide I'll show you, or no, sorry, a couple more, but the color index, the phenocris. So the phenocris say mafic, the color index says felsic. So it's a confusing message. If you have a microscope, you can then look and see, these are little tiny plagioclase crystals. You're seeing the twins. It's really common to see twinned crystals in, under the microscope. Um, and then these are pyroxenes. These are amphiboles right here. So, um, and then you've got this kind of a glassy matrix, it's black. You don't, you can't see much else. So even with a microscope, you still can't identify all the minerals in that rock. That's where the chemical analysis comes in. Um, okay, so I've said that. Okay, but this is an intermediate composition. I'm gonna get to the diagram where I compare some examples of that. Okay, phenocris. You can actually see some of the zoning in the plagioclases here. Check it out. So do you see, this is one large crystal. There's a couple crystals next to it, but there's one large one and it's got like a messy kind of center to it. But then you see these rings around. Those rings are the growth rings. So I would guess that the center of this feldspar of this plagioclase is more calcium rich and the edges are more sodium rich. Okay, and what happens is phenocris, um, this is giving also a mis mixed message, message, right? Because it's got big crystals and it's got small crystals. So is it plutonic or is it volcanic? The answer is that the phenocris are crystallizing in the magma chamber underground before the, the rock is erupt, before that magma is erupted. And when it's erupted, it carries those crystals with it. And then the rest of the magma is crystallized as a, well, it's a lava at that point, then the lava crystallizes. So we still have some small crystals in this ground mass um, in between the big crystals. It's still considered volcanic because this is a, a porphyritic texture, meaning it's that large crystals in a fine grain ground, ground mass. Oh, wrong direction. All right, this is the slide I was talking about. Okay, so as far as naming volcanic rocks goes, here's what I want you to use. This is your guide, these are your guidelines. Here are a couple of rhyolites over here. Um, and I should have probably put mafic and felsic on here, but you can write it in your notes. Um, these two are both rhyolites. This one is clearly light colored, right? You can't see much in it. Um, but it's a it's a fine grain ground mass. It's light colored. This is a little bit darker. It's pinkish, not tan. That's okay because pink is is a color that you know we see in K K feldspars. But this has light colored phenocris in it, doesn't it? So these could be quartz or K spars even. They might be sodic plagioclases, but they're light colored. And you can tell that knowing nothing else. There's light colored chunks in there. Um, so a, a medium colored matrix with light colored phenocris um, or a light colored matrix 
with light phenacris. That tells you that it's felsic, that it's rhyolitic. If you've got a basalt, you've got a dark rock. It's black or dark gray. And you might have phenacris of black minerals or of olivines. Here's some olivines that are green. And you see, notice the bubbles too. I put this in here because this is a, a, a vesicular texture. I gave you that term on Tuesday, but I didn't show you a picture, I don't think. These are those trapped gas bubbles that are preserved in the rock. Anyway, the point is you might see black phenacris, you might see green phenacris, but overall the message is dark matrix, dark phenacris. That's basaltic. If you get a mixed message, dark matrix, light phenacris, or lighter matrix with dark phenacris, go intermediate. So that's an andesite. And that's the best you can do with your naked eye without a microscope, without a chemical analysis. That's what you're gonna use. You're gonna, that's using the color index and that's using the composition of the phenacris. Okay, so you're just gonna use light and dark as a comparison. So overall light colored, light crystals, rhyolite, dark, dark crystals, andesite, dark, dark crystals, mafic. Basalt. Questions? This is the, the simplest I could make it for you guys. Now that's for crystalline rocks. We also have glass. Volcanic glass is always rhyolitic. So you, you only get these glasses like obsidian flows and pumice um, in rhyol from rhyolitic magmas. This is glass too. It's just, it had a lot of bubbles in it. It's like a froth. The lava would have been like frothy. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So you said the volcanic glass only comes from rhyolitic magma. Yeah. So the obsidian came from rhyolitic magma? Even, even though, though it's, it's so black. dark? Yep. Oh. That's why I wanted to make sure you knew that. Even though it's, this is simply a phenomenon of light and glass interplaying. Um, I can't explain it better than that. I've looked, I've looked at research to say like, what, what can explain why it's so dark? And I can't accept from saying it's, it's just the way the light interacts with the glass. So yes, pumice is usually light colored. I've seen different shades of gray in pumice. Um, you also see like reddish obsidians, which is probably from oxidation from being erupted into the air. Um, but usually it's black. And yeah, in this case, all volcanic glass is rhyolitic. Don't, um, in fact, maybe I should write that. All volcanic glass is rhyolitic. Okay. So even you're not there. There are no phenacris to use here, and the color index is not helpful. So just remember that. I told you color is tricky. Color can be helpful and it can lead you astray. Okay, so we looked at this before. We've looked at the silica composition from mafic to felsic. We've looked at the temperatures. I wanted to just give you a graphical something to show the graphically the viscosity from a low resistance thin runny lava that's basalt to a thick sticky lava in a rhyolite. And I'm going to give you some examples of what these look like, but um, just to this sort of complements the other graphs I've given you. Okay. And then of course, there's not only is it runny versus thick and sticky, it's an effusive eruption. Um, in, in fact, I'll even write, it's effusive. It's not explosive. Um, and that's all a result of the viscosity, which is controlled by the silica content and the gas content, right? It's low gas, in the low dissolved gases. And so, and they're, they can escape more easily into the atmosphere from the magma too, before it's ever erupted. So it generally is gentle, a gentle eruption. 
If you can't remember effusive, that's okay. Just say gentle eruption instead of explosive or some other term for that, I'll understand. Now, this is a pyroclastic flow. This is from an explosive eruption in Japan um, of a composite of a stratovolcano. I don't remember the name of the volcano. Sakura, Sakurakawa, Sakurajima, it's something like that. Um, this gives on a regular basis pyroclastic flows and in fact killed a couple of famous um, volcanologists who were famous, uh, Maurice and Katya Croft, who took some of the really famous pictures of volcanoes that you find around, or at least historically before everybody had a camera with them and a video camera with them in their phone. Um, and they, they, they were volcanologists and then they like dedicated themselves to actually just being videographers and photographers of these phenomena. They died in one in this at this volcano from a pyroclastic flow. It turned, I guess it, it was unexpected, which, you know, and that's the way they wanted to die anyway. He said so in one video I saw, <laughs> Maurice did. Um, so these are the dangerous and pyroclastic flows is one of the most dangerous hazards of an explosive volcano. And this comes from like pyro is the hot and clastic means like pieces, chunks. So hot class pieces of volcanic rock and gases. Okay, the kind of volcano you get is different. Um, depending on the, the magma type. With mafic magmas, you end up with shield volcanoes. They have a very low profile. They are not tall, pointy pe peaked volcanoes like we're used to seeing with like uh, Mount St. Helens or Mount Fuji. Uh, this is called composite here because it's got, a, there's a cinder cone on its side. It's a composite cone just means it's a stratovolcano with other kinds of eruptions on it as well. So stratovolcano plus cinder cone equals a composite cone. Don't worry about it. You can say composite or stratovolcano and I'll know you're talking about a stratovolcano. <clears throat> These are the explosive kind. Um, they're a lot smaller than a shield volcano, even though we think of them as big, tall mountains with these pointy peaks, like usually snow covered peaks too. Look at the size. This is like a Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens or Mount Fuji in relation to a Mauna Kea on Hawaii. It's much smaller. The cal First of all, there's our caldera, not a crater. And I've got a slide to show you the difference there. It's a, the angle, the sides of its of the volcano, of its flanks are low lying. They're not steep. And it, it spans like this is like 150, 200 kilometers wide compared to maybe 10 or 12 kilometers for a, a stratovolcano. Stratovolcano might be three kilometers high versus nine kilometers in a, in a shield volcano. And then the other common volcano type is a cinder cone. These are really small. You can hike up these quickly in just maybe an hour instead of a day to get up a, a stratovolcano. Um, they are a few, you know, a, this is like a few hundred meters high, maybe a kilometer across. So they're um, much smaller. What else that I see that I have words here that are not visible, so I'll make them visible. I have a question. Yes. So um, what type of magma um, compositions come from each type here? Okay, so um, the shield volcanoes and cinder cones both erupt uh, basaltic material whether it's lava or in the case of a cinder cone, it's exploding like um, small like blocks and bombs. I'll get, I'll show you how we designate those terms based on size in a bit. The, this is tends to be mafic. These are mafic. Stratovolcanoes are felsic to intermediate. Usually, you know, andesite I gave you is like the typical 
stratovolcano composition. That's true, but um, those are the only kinds of volcanoes that will ever give you a rhyolitic lava too, or a rhyolitic pumice. Okay. I'm gonna show you some pictures now. Here's Mauna Kea from Mauna Loa. Um, and you see it has this low profile to it within their basalts here. We have one in California, if you can believe it or not. This is Medicine, ah, this is Medicine Lake Volcano. And it also has, this is up in the Northeast corner, um, north of Shasta and Lassen, but and not too far south of the Oregon border. So this is kind of in the, the border between, in the, the corner of California between Nevada and Oregon. It's spectacular. There are, even though, <laughs> I just said Medicine Lake or shield volcanoes erupt mafic lavas. There are spectacular obsidian and pumice flows on the Medicine Lake volcano. It's in a slightly different tectonic position. It's not a, an oceanic hotspot like Mauna Kea is. It's coming up through crust. So it's got a mixed signature. So don't worry about that. But road, this is road trip worthy, this place. Um, it's in between Lassen National Park and uh, Lava Beds National Monument. Those are both also great places. This is a great, I actually take this trip every other year. Every other year in my volcanology class, I go to Lassen and Medicine Lake and Lava Beds and alternate years I go to the Eastern side of the Sierra Nevada to Mammoth and to look at the, um, uh, the Long Valley Caldera and a bunch of obsidian flows over there. Another reason to take volcanology if, you, if you're interested. Basaltic lava flows look like this. They look like rivers of basalt, molten basalt. And oftentimes when they're runny like this, when the, the lowest viscosity basalts look ropey, it's called pohoihoi. It's a Hawaiian word that means this ropey lava. Um, it's different than an a'a -a flow, which this is slightly more viscous basalt and the escaping gases kind of give it a jagged appearance instead of being smooth. So this is a fragmented, jagged, discontinuous surface. And the joke goes, you know, they called it ah ah because that's what the sound you make when you walk over these rocks barefoot. Ah, ah, ah. Get it? <laughs> I know it was dumb. Okay. Um, here are some cinder cones in, uh, this is Mauna Kea. So this is up near the observatory on Mauna Kea over which there are a bunch of indigenous uh, rights protesters over the last year or so. I forgot that was there. Anyway, these are kind of like parasitic volcano, volcanoes on within, they're actually within the caldera. And they actually look at, the, so they usually erupt small chunks, blocks and bombs, ash, gases, small pieces, pea-sized pieces of rock. But they can erupt flows. Here's a, a basaltic flow coming out of the base of this volcano, of the, the cinder cone. So sometimes they erupt these lavas, other times they're erupting cinders, but they're a small feature. It's almost like, you know, the there's like last little gasps of magma that are left in the caldera, uh, under the caldera surface and they, they pop up <laughs> kind of like zits on, a <laughs> on the volcano, on the shield volcano. Okay, I've got some movies for you. This is a basaltic eruption, hopefully. Go. Okay, I'll just won't touch anything. Okay, I'm just gonna, it's just a minute. So this is from um, 2018. I don't know if you guys were aware, but there was a huge eruption um, of the Mauna Kea crater on the Big Island, on the east side of the Big Island in 2018. It actually created new island. It was, there was so much lava that came out. But what I want you to see here, it's fountaining. This is called fountaining up the top. 
what I want you to see is that it looks like a river. It flows like a river. It is, this is not viscous. This is low viscosity. There was a, a neighborhood that this, co this covered part of a neighborhood there. And so people lost their houses. It dumped out into the sea. And people were stupidly taking boats out here and snorkeling and diving with the lava too, which I don't recommend. Just because on the way into the water, it can be explosive. So that's a lava with about 50% silica. <clears throat> so it's um, low viscosity compared to a felsic lava. Here's a weird kind of lava. And this is called a carbonatite. Well, it's a carbonatite volcano. It's a weird, weird composition. It's only got, oh, here's the word. I wonder where that went. Um, only 10% silica or less. So it's extremely low viscosity, even though um, it's also pretty cold. It's only about 500 degrees or it's lower than that even in places. It's really low viscosity um, it, in large part because it doesn't have that silica in it. It's like water or a thin mud. And notice it's also not glowing, right? It's not hot enough to glow during the daytime. I so want to go check this out. It's not always active, but Tanzania's got some other stuff to offer. He's going to let it hit, its sho hit his shoe. Jesus. All the gases escaping there. Ah, oh, so cool. And it and it when it cools, it actually turns white. Okay. We don't need to see the whole thing, but it's totally cool. And there are other, if you just like lose yourself in YouTube, you can like find a bunch of different kinds of eruptions like that. Okay, but first, strata volcanoes. Okay, you guys, I have to leave out of here promptly at noon. I have a, a virtual medical appointment that I've got to take. So I'm gonna try to take us as far as I can get to noon, and then I'm gonna stop wherever we are. If you've got questions though, please interrupt me now because you won't have a chance after noon today. I can come back online after my appointment. It only takes like 10 minutes. Then I'll come back and have my office hour. Well, 20 minutes at that time. Um, just so you know, you can use the same link and come back to as you do for, same link as for the lecture, come back for the, um, the office hour time. Okay, here are some I have a question. Yes. So um, my family usually goes to Mount Lassen every year mm -hmm. and um, that carbonatite, that magma kind of reminded me of what comes out of the ground at Bumpus Hell. Oh. What is it that comes out of the ground at Bumpus Hell? Cause it kind of looks like that muddy water, like what we just saw. Yeah. In that case, you are just seeing water, um, oh, but okay. it, it's full of a bunch of part particles. Um, and, you know, it's, it is muddy there, um, but I'm sure it's got a lot of, you know, it's got all those carb, carbon compounds, sulfur compounds, um, other, other things that it's forming, just interacting with the groundwater and with the, the soil. So it's a mixture of kind of like, it's, it's mostly in fact, it's it's probably not any new material. It's probably all just rock, soil, and groundwater that's being heated by the volcano and coming up to the surface, cooling, and it goes down at cycles, like in a convection cell. But you're not actually getting eruption of new magma or anything like that. Whereas what we just saw at um, Old Daniel Lungai in Tanzania, that's actually lava. There's no lava at Bumpus Hell. That's just groundwater. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So all these kinds of volcanoes 
are what we get at subduction zones. Okay, so all of these volcanoes that are part of the Cascade Range, Crater Lake, Lassen, Shasta, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, those are all um, straddle volcanoes or composite volcanoes. This is a lava dome. Okay, so this is a lava dome that is rising up in, the, in a crater of this Mexican volcano. This is what rhyolitic lava does because it's so viscous. It creates a steep-sided feature. Here's, here's the, what, uh, the one, the rhyolitic lava dome that's in Mount St. Helens' crater. Um, this is after the 1980 eruption, which is why we can see it so well, because part of the side of the volcano is missing after that landslide. So see how it's so steep-sided. I can't find any video of rhyolitic lavas, but I think I know why I can't find any videos of rhyolitic lavas erupting. You guys know? You want to think about it for a sec? Would it just be like too dangerous to film? Totally. Yes. Too dangerous to film. You can't get anywhere close enough. So you'd have to have like a, a camera pointed at it uh, in the crater or something and be watching virtually, but I haven't found one yet. Totally. So, okay. So this is the lava dome. And that was one of those features on that last, the diagram showing of the thick, sticky, viscous lava. That's what rhyolite does. In an explosive eruption, you get lots of, I've been talking about these. I've been talking about blocks and bombs. These are bombs because they're kind of football shaped. They're, they're streamlined because they were erupted when they were still molten. It was molten lava or partially molten. And they like strung out as they're flying out of the volcano and then they land and some of them probably have like a little smoosh side because of, they were still molten when they landed. Ash is another thing, lots and lots of ash. And then lapilli, that's a dime for scale. So these are pea-sized particles. And so cinder cones are mostly ash, lapilli, and some blocks and bombs. They're, this stuff is usually tends to be mafic when it's a um, when we're talking about a basaltic cinder cone. But this is called pyro, these are pyroclastic material, hot class, right? These are what come out of the air. These are airfall fragments. So instead of lava flow to give us a basaltic lava and then a basalt, we're getting ash and lapilli and bombs. A block would simply be a piece of rock that was solid when it was erupted. And so it's just a hunk of rock. It doesn't look at, like any different from any other rock you might pick off off the ground, random sides. It doesn't look streamlined, look like this. Okay, so when we're class, of, oh, it's noon, oh shit. Okay, I've got to go, you guys. I'm going to leave you with this. We'll pick up with the airfall fragments and the size designation on Tuesday, okay? I'm coming back for my office hour. I'll be here tomorrow from 11 to 1, all right? I got to go. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, Google.